This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. I told you we'd come back. We came back. It's the 130 block, if you will, here on a given Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Think Tech Talks. Now, you may not know this, but last Saturday, you should have known it, was the Visitor Industry Charity Walk in and around and back to Ala Moana from Waikiki. And uh, we were there. We took footage, and that footage is going to play this Sunday and the week following, and every day in the week following on OC16. So take a look at it. And it includes uh, lots of wonderful conversations with the people who are walking. Some of them are pretty interesting. Some of them are really funny. And one of them, one of the conversations, was with Prashant Doshi, who was right there in front of, where was it? Um, it was right near the Ilikai. Ilikai yeah. Yeah, right near the Ilikai. And uh, that, was worth, that was worth having. And if you watch our show at 1030 on Sunday, you'll see a bit of Pr Prashant. So welcome to the show, Pr Prashant. Nice to have you here yet again. Well, great to be here, Jay. It was an interesting story you talked about. It was a story about tech, it was entrepreneurship, a story about, hmm, courage in the marketplace, if indeed, you will. Indeed. So let me see if I can pick up on the thread. You're, you're here in Hawaii because you want to do tech. And uh, we always like that because our middle name actually happens to be tech. <laughs> so you were in New York, which is my you know, original hometown. Yeah. And you were doing three, not one, not two, but three tech companies there. And you up, upended all of that and sold them all or in the process yeah. in the process so and yeah. we'll ask you about that sure. <clears throat> and came out here because this is a a better place for many reasons and we'll talk about that too and uh, you wanted to establish a tech company and in fact um today what's today's date 23rd of may it's 23rd of may it's my okay. wife's birthday your wife's birthday um prashant doshi formed a hawaii llc and following through on what he said he was going to do on, on Saturday, <laughs> called Shreem, that's H-S-R-E-E-M, L-L-C, right here in Hawaii. Ne. Good for you. It's a good beginning. What does Shreem mean? So Shreem is actually uh, an ancient Indian mantra. Uh, it's a beach mantra, and it's the mantra for Lakshmi. And Lakshmi is the goddess of prosperity. So when you literally say Shreem, you're invoking prosperity. And you don't have to be Hindu or what have you. It's, it's about invoking prosperity. That's pretty good. Yeah. I haven't heard the name before, so it looks like I got a lock on that one. I, I hope so. And I do have a trademark on it as well. Go get a website right away. <laughs> <laughs> Shreemkama.com or something. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about um, you know the story. Sure. So how did you come by having three tech companies in New York City? Yeah, so it, it is actually, the, the, it starts in New York City. Um, so I'm originally from MIT. And I've been in a variety of industries across the board, everything from uh, manufacturing to um, uh, telecom, cybersecurity. Uh, this story kind of starts in the late 90s. I was, uh, I'm independent, but I was consulting to the Giuliani administration through a private sector company. Giuliani? Did you say Giuliani? I did. I thought you said Giuliani. I, I did. He's no longer my hero, I got to tell you. You know, I, I, if we want to make this a political hero? no, he's not. And actually, he's kind of, I'm, no offense, uh, but he's <laughs> letting me down a little bit in some of the choices he's more You and recent. millions of others, yeah, but that's another story. But he, he was a, a fantastic mayor at the time. I mean, I grew up, I was born in Hoboken and uh, New York uh, back in the day. How the mighty have fallen from grace. I, yeah. I, yeah, I Hoboken. Yeah, I was. I was born in Hoboken, me, Frank Sinatra, and baseball. One of the three of us is not well known. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, no, but I um, back to New York. Uh, we were there in the late, I was there in the late 90s, and uh, I was coming back from Europe. Uh, I had been working in the telecom arena, and uh, the, uh, the head of HR of the company that I was a multi billion uh, uh, multinational corporation said, You know, you're, you get bored easily, you like to solve new problems, we're going to throw you into health and human services, and uh, I knew nothing about it, and I had never worked with the government before. But they have pills for this, you know. Yeah, they <laughs> So we were in New York City. If you, you probably have heard, you know, sort of the broken windows theory, which is the, it's essentially, New York was not, was a crime-ridden place, right? And uh, it was a difficult place to go to. Uh, people like to not hang out in New York City. And uh, Giuliani, you know, he, former uh, district attorney, really cleaned it up. And the story is actually a story about data and the use of uh, technology and data. Uh, what they found out, essentially, is that the big stuff relates to the small stuff. So big crime, uh, is expensive to resolve, has a low hit rate, 
and uh, it's very difficult, okay? Uh, the small stuff is, uh, what the data showed, is that it's correlated to the big stuff. So we're talking about graffiti and turnstile jumping and uh, broken windows, hence the broken window theory. And the idea was that if you could uh, be tough on the small stuff, the big stuff goes away. And it was true. It was a true theory. It actually worked it, that it, way. It actually and worked. he capitalized on that, and he made the city a lot safer. He did. He, and I definitely credit him for that. I mean, all, all hats off to him, uh, you know, the uh, police chief, and, and all the precinct commanders. And well, in 9-11, he was pretty good in that. Well, and I was there on 9-11. I yeah. watched the towers come, d come down. Uh, that leads to a second story, but I There's actually... There's watch. I, yeah. Well, and I ended up running the city's, uh, part of the city's disaster relief efforts in New York City. So that was incredible. But the story was about performance management and, and analytics. And I had come from this very similar background in other industries and using data strategically. What did you study at MIT? I did chemical engineering and economics. And I disagreed with most of my economics professors. And <laughs> most of my chemical engineer professors probably didn't like me much either. Uh, but I'm, that's not atypical. Thinker, yeah. yeah, that kind of sort of happens. And, um, yeah, but, but the story about using data strategically, and then we applied that uh, to the health and human services field. Um, long story short, I ended up creating a, a program there called CenterStat. It was one of the finalists for Harvard's Inno Innovation Awards in government. And it was uh, basically about using data to help government people. Now, just mind you, government is not what I would call at the top of the list in terms of accountability and performance and results, okay? And, and that's what it was about. It was about culture. It was about using data strategically to recognize people. Analytics. Analytics. And, and that uh, ended up, long story short, uh, you know, the welfare rolls were cut in half, went from a million to half a million. Uh, typically, New in, York. In the city of in New the York? City, in the city. The, the, all five boroughs or just the, the, uh, the Five boroughs. And so there were a million people on welfare in the mid-90s, okay? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then half a million by the time we were done. Uh, and typically, the agencies were putting in about ten or 15,000 people in the jobs. Giuliani, in I think it was 2000, had given us a goal of 100,000. None of us thought that was achievable, uh, but we achieved 133,000 job placements. And that's a collective story. That's not a story about me. That's a story about all of us working together. Just, but you, all of you working together with this uh, data stack, what did you call it? Uh, the, this program in particular was called CenterStat. And it was Center one, of, Center one of three Stat. major programs that all okay, so worked. So that was company number one. One. That was not a company. That I was working for another company at the time. Okay. And then uh, from there, I went and, um, uh, you know, because I was involved in disaster relief, I went to D.C. I launched a, we, uh, in the company that I was with, launched a cybersecurity practice. Um, that happens. That's a long story. I ended up uh, sort of leaving and uh, deciding, took a severance and went out to the West Coast and uh, have always continued to move out west since. Um, and from there, decided uh, with a, a partner to take what we had learned in New York City and uh, apply it to a broader uh, group in, in health and human services. So what were the three companies you Exemplar, established? <coughs> the three companies were Exemplar Human Services, Exemplar Analytics, and Exemplar Corporation. And uh, these are kind of three companies that work in tandem uh, that uh, primarily help uh, government agencies and uh, a lot, most of our, like our business. city or state agencies? C city, uh, yeah, county agencies in particular. And California is a big mainstay, was a mainstay of our business uh, because there's California, if you know now, is uh, like the fifth largest economy in the world, about 37 million people. And yeah, uh, yeah. there are 58 counties. So, but so, you were in New York before you came out. Here. This was, no, I was in uh, in California before this. But the work came out. Why you remember New York is a we're both from there, and yeah. b uh, the work kind of you know spun out of of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's sort of okay. The story. So your last place of is California. Was in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, is it San Francisco area? Uh, it's all over California. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. We're virtual. Okay, yeah. so you, you have these virtual companies. Uh, they're they're surviving, if not doing really They've well. They've done very well, um, and um, yeah. you're you're able to go where you want. And you decide you come to Hawaii and and sell them. How easy is it to sell a tech company? three tech companies in California right now. Yeah, you know, uh, the thing that we do is very unique. Um, I had developed the only software as a service cloud-based model for what we do, uh, still, you know, uh, 11 years ago. Still is the only one. We typically compete, if you will, with the large systems software integrators. Software as a service is a term that I heard 10 years ago. Yeah, you're right. I don't yeah. hear it anymore. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, you know, cloud-based, uh, you know, reporting and analytics service. Yeah. So it's still the only one um, in, in, in California and, and in the industry space, at least the best of my knowledge that exists. So it's fairly unique. It's a fairly uh, attractive kind of proposition because of its uh, placement. And so the, how do you sell a company like that? Well, it could, that's part of the thing that's happening right now is it may, 
it may be to the uh, you know the other the other shareholders, and maybe we have uh, you know foreign buyers that are very interested. So we're just right now trying to figure out what's the best. Well, why don't thing. you hold on to it and appoint someone else? To yeah, run it? I mean that that, that is part. I, I did I did actually. Then you can I, sit on the beach. <clears> and yeah, viewers, it's a, you know? yeah. You know, I've never sat on the beach. I'm one of these kind of guys that doesn't <laughs> sleep all that much, and I work about you know 18, yeah. 19 hours a day. I understand. Back in Hoboken and MIT, you were a shy child. You know, um, I doubt I'm, that I'm anyone ki- ever kidding, would say I'm that. Kidding. Yeah. I, okay. My wife would hope that someone would say that, but no, that's not happening today. <laughs> All right, so you haven't sold them yet. It's in the, it's, it's kind of near. Got buyers? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Definitely. So yeah. it's up to the lawyers. Yeah, it is. That's where it is. That's yeah. exactly They're important in, in they, the development of tech. They are actually important. You know, I never, uh, my dad always said I should have been a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, you know, actually, I really do want to bring that up. And this is, you know, to the folks out there. Um, this is a shout uh, there out it is. camera. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is a shout out to the camera. One of the, I think, the main important things if you're in a startup, and because you tend not to spend a lot of money because you're bootstrapping, and defensive IP and making sure you have agreements in place, partnership agreements, uh, membership confidentiality, IP protection, hugely important. And typically something, even us as a, as a company, really didn't do a great job in the beginning. And you sort of pay the price if you don't do it right. Oh, sure, right. it catches up with you. Yeah. yeah, it really does. And, and you have to have a lawyer who will dot the I's and cross the T's. And, and one that actually knows the subject matter area well. Right, and yeah. it's very specialized. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I guess we can have another show about this, but how do you determine whether the lawyer who presents as specialized, especially in tech, especially with certain kinds of technology and intellectual property, how do you know he's real? Yeah. I mean, you can be a lawyer, but it doesn't mean you know that stuff. Yeah. Anyway, okay, moving, moving on forward. Yeah. Um, so you decide one day, it comes down, a vision perhaps, it comes down to you, a light is shining on your face, and there's a voice, and the voice is saying, <laughs> <laughs> Go to Hawaii? Rashad, go west, young man. It says, go to Hawaii, get on uh, the beach. No, get on to the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, form a corporation. Yes, I did. And, do and it it's here. one of the best websites I've seen. So easy. I did it in about 15 minutes this so morning. So tell me about the light coming down. Yeah, you know, so what happened is about, you know, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, you know, it was clear that the vision, my vision and uh, the vision of the sharehold, the other shareholders uh, w- was, was sort of diverging. Um, I'm, I think, very globally and I wanted to do business globally. And um, uh, the others uh, kind of wanted to stick within one vertical within the United States. And, and I'm not suggesting that um, you know, the US is great, but you know, tech is one of those things where truly you could be located anywhere. Sure. I, I've now spent in the last four months, I've been on four different continents. I've been, spent a lot of time in India, the UAE, Scotland, Australia, uh, and here Hawaii, and then California. And I tell you, I've been amazed at the innovation that's going on around the world. Uh, in pockets. Now, people t- tend to think of Silicon Valley, right? I hang out a lot in Palo Alto and Stanford and what have you. And innovation is happening everywhere. And, uh, you know, it's uh, so, it, so the application, whether the ideas now are, come from everywhere. I, I actually believe that money is not the, the real currency anymore. Um, and of course, if you own any Bitcoin, you would know a little bit about that, I'm sure. Um, I actually wrote a social we have currency. 27 shows on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah I wrote the, a, a social currency prior to Bitcoin. Uh, but um, what I was going to say is that you know, ideas come from everywhere. And I believe uh, information, knowledge, insights, that's the new currency of the world. Yeah, well, you know, we look, we look for sea changes. That's what it's all about for us. We want to spot the sea changes. We don't want the little pieces. We want to look at the big pieces. We want to find out how the world is changing so we can sort of gauge ourselves or, you know, to integrate better in yeah. it. And, uh, one, and, and so I think, I think it's absolutely true. Change in general. And one of the changes, you know, I'm, and I'm thinking of um, Ai Weiwei's uh, new movie. Yeah. That's when it was in February, I think it opened up. Um, it's called um, Human Flow. Yeah. And it's about refugee camps around the world. There are 65 million people. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I don't think a lot of people did know that. And it's a sea change. The world has changed and we weren't watching. Right. And now he helps us understand the sea change and how we better stay conscious about that because it could lead somewhere that we don't like. Um, so the same thing here. There's a sea change happened. Yeah. It's not all in Silicon Valley. No, it's not. It's not all in Beijing either no, or in no, Tianjin. No. Um, it could be anywhere now. It could be in Europe. Okay, let's go further than Europe. You know, let's go to Asia. Let's go to India. Let's go to yeah. Southeast Asia. Absolutely. They're, they're out there. Kids, I say kids. And yeah. You're not a kid anymore. Although you're not shy yeah, either. No, right? um, uh, you know, who are having innovative thoughts because the, the fundamental building blocks 
of making information technology are available to everyone instantly. That's, and that's the piece. That is, and, and I want to underscore that point. I mean, I think uh, technology, IT, and all the technology fields is the great equalizer of this generation, right? Globally. Well, globally. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you have, you know, if you can get access to connect into the internet, get some, and most of so much of freeware is available now, that you can build something that could transform the world. So I just want to ask one more question before we take a sure. break. Yeah. You know, in order to use these building blocks, in order to be innovative, in order to transform the world, I think you can confirm one way or the other. I think you don't need to go to MIT. And if you went to MIT, you don't need to finish MIT. It's been proven so many times. We, we, this is a discussion that's a particular area of passion for me. Um, I took the uh, former Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, to task in, in Stanford. She was at a global education forum. And they were all kind of beating on the drums of college, college, college. And you hear that in, in the country. And I'm telling you, that's absolutely untrue, especially when it comes to so tech. What do you need? What you need, is, first of all, you need some chutzpah, okay? You, you need some courage. You need to be a good observer of humanity. Look for problems. The first thing is to find out what problem or unique value proposition you're gonna create. <laughs> you gotta be right? a pessimist and find the problem. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> but, but once you do, then you think creatively, uh, you apply some technology, and I believe in, in fast pilots and agile technology, doing things, not sitting in some, you know, backed in the old software, war, you know, yeah, exactly. Right? You look at, think about Uber, right? It's not just about the app. It's about a democratization and unleashing. I had a piece in Civil Beat this morning, came to that same conclusion. It's the democratization it is. of our society right now, well, right here. I was with, I mean, I can't, because I, I've been taking Ubers all around Honolulu because I was like, why well, rent a car? I can take Uber everywhere. I mean, at 3 a.m., I took an Uber this morning after my walk, right? And uh, my, my point, I, I've met a realtor whose uh, child is at Punahou, who, who in between, uh, you know, showings, it's like, hey, I'm already on the road. Let me use Uber or Lyft or whomever it is, right? The point is, is that this was, people had an asset, it was called their car. They have another asset, it's called their time. And Uber connected those two with the real easy interface and said, hey, you want to make some money? And especially important in a place like Hawaii, where a lot of people have a second it's job. It's brilliant. And, and right after this break, for science, I want to find out how uh, you're going to do the same thing. Not the same exact app, sure. but yeah. how you're going to do the same thing right here in River City. We'll be right back. You'll see. This is going to be amazing. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Stay in the hall. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. You're probably glad you stayed around because now it really gets good <laughs> with, with Prashant Doshi. And uh, we're talking about this company he started, but before we get into the, the grassroots of that and the, and the weeds, if you will, I want to follow through on the, on the one point about whether you need MIT and finishing MIT in order to do Uku Bucks. Uh, absolutely. I mean, look, I'm very thankful that I got to, uh, into MIT and I had a great run at MIT and it obviously opens a lot of doors for me. But I can absolutely assure you that it's unnecessary. Uh, and you look at now the, the burden of college debt, okay? And people coming out, what, you're, you know, 300,000 easily in the hole and assuming you get, you know, people are paying their college loans forever. Apprenticeships is the key. I've studied apprenticeships around the world, okay? Germany is one of the best models. Switzerland's another good model. They've done it in the UK. But the one that I think is most relatable to Hawaii and the US in general is Australia. I was just down there for, for, for quite some time last month. 
and they have a national apprenticeship strategy. Okay? Wherever you go in Australia, you can get an apprenticeship across a ton of industries. I met with people from the government, from the private sector, apprentices. You know, the, they call it a year 13, uh, right after high school that you can go. But it starts with a cultural acceptance that you are not less than because you didn't go to college. That's the big problem we have in this country, mm -hmm. is that we think that if you don't go to college, there's something wrong with you. I tell you, you can be a plumber making twice as much money as the guy that graduates with a BS and, you know, and, uh, and I didn't mean BS is in BS, but you know, a bachelor's in some sort of degree and, uh, and, and still not making enough money. So apprenticeships are key. I, I'd like to highlight a particular example or model. Uh, so Jim McKelvey, the co-founder of Square, is a colleague of mine um, and an esteemed colleague of mine. And Jim got very upset after he launched Square and that became a you know, multi-billion dollar success that you know, no one teaches really how to code, okay? And so there are a number of coding academies out of there, but the key thing that Jim did. We have one here. Yeah, the key thing that Jim did is not just 16, anyone 16 to 60 can learn how to code, okay? But after you do that in the three to six month academy, you get an apprenticeship and you work somewhere, okay? And they, they make sure that it ha that happens. All of his results are on launchcode.org. Go check them out. And the basic story is he takes people that had uh, earnings expectation of ten to fifteen dollars an hour and turns them into fifty, 50 to sixty thousand dollar jobs. Right, particularly and, and important entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, and, and entrepreneurs, and that's particularly important and relevant here in Hawaii because we have a brain drain problem, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's a brain surgeon, and he's got a leak in his house under the sink. He calls a plumber, and the plumber slides under there. He hits the thing with a couple of a hammer, you know, slides out. He says it's all fixed. The brain surgeon says, "How much is that going to be?" Is it going to be $1,500? $1,500? I'm a brain surgeon. I don't make that kind of money. And a plumber says, you know, when I was a brain surgeon, I didn't make that kind of money either. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here, Jay. Okay, let's go, let's go to the weeds now. What do you got in mind for uh, Shreem LLC? Okay, so Shreem, it's, it's a couple of parts. And it's a, it's a concept, it's a strategy, it's an approach and a methodology more than anything else. All right, so as I was telling you, I've been working with the government agencies to try to impact social, social good change, right? And I'm a little frustrated. I tell you, you know, the government's not the easiest of, of organizations to deal with. Uh, very you heard good. it here on Think Tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard it here. I mean, I'll, I'll sign anything. <laughs> I mean, look, a lot of folks in Silicon Valley and other places stay away from the government because they're hard to do business with, okay, uh, in general. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so I, I'm also frustrated with that. And uh, look, there's some amazing people in the government, but the, the, the burden of the bureaucracy just makes it difficult for entrepreneurship to flourish. And we've had to fight tooth and nail and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in 12, 13 years. And I'm like, there's got to be an easier way. think you're going to do better here? Well, so I don't want to do it in the government, OK? So my thought is that I'm going to go into the commercial sectors. Now, prior to this, these companies, I was all in the commercial sector, in telecom, and manufacturing, and fintech, all these different ones. And I'm not, it, it's, it's more cutthroat, okay, but, and the competition's higher, but it's easier. If I sit there, your CEO or CFO or, you know, head of technology, and I convince you that I can make you money, save you money, improve efficiencies or what have you, you're going to give me a chance. I could do that with you in government, and it might be two years later that we actually have a contract. Oh, yeah, and the other thing with government is you don't know what motivates them. Well, maybe exactly. Power, maybe, yeah. or maybe they don't like the way you part your hair. Who knows what Well, and is. sometimes doing things like saving costs is actually not a good thing because their budgets might get cut in the next exactly. cycle, right? So, but in business, you always know what the bottom line is, the bottom line is the bottom Line. Exactly. And so I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to go back to my, my history and the things I learned prior to these companies. And then what I'm going to do is work in the commercial sectors. And then, and this is my, and I'm announcing it right here so you guys can all hold me accountable. You start taking notes now. So, um, so I was in India for four months, right? And they implemented a 2% uh, CSR requirement, corporate social responsibility, meaning 2% of income. I, mean, I forget if it's uh, yeah, net income will go to Altruism. Doing good, right? Altruism. So the right? common good. Yeah. Mine is going to be 11%. Why 11? Why not 15? Yeah, uh, well, oh, hey, hey, now, come on. Now i got to make some money again. <laughs> well, 11 is still five times more than uh, what they're mandating in India, okay, right? Okay. And, uh, but, but the idea is, and I like the number 11, but, but the reason is that I believe uh, in tech, if you operate efficiently, first of all, you can but, have those kind of margins. Does 11 have some symbolic meaning to you? It, it, it does, uh, okay. but that would be like a eight, whole, uh, you know, so I have 888, like eight, 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 yeah, yeah, so you, that, you know that. Long life and everything. And, that's right. In Chinese, but. Uh, 11's a mystical number, 
Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's uh, you know it's a divine mystical number. Oh, now I understand. Yeah. So so 11% uh, will go, and and what I'm deciding right now. So remember, I told you before, stream. I actually did a, a social currency, and what what originally I was thinking was taking 11% of dollars and giving it to places, right? And that's how I'll do the social good. I decided differently uh, as recently as this week after I met you. Um, that something I said. Yeah, yeah, it was something you said. Uh, you positively influenced me. Uh, the 11% what I'm going to do is use that to hire people that will then give away for free to the government or the nonprofit sector their expertise, okay? So you're getting a multiplier effect, right? So the 11% of net income will be used to say, for instance, instead of us, my, my previous company, working directly with the government agency, health and human services or child welfare, whatever it is, I will hire someone or contract with someone and use that money to get an expert to work for free with the government. So then we don't have that contracting crap. We don't need people come in and you know, sign their agreements and say, we're just giving them to you for free. The other thing is I'm going to use a lot of, I'm going to call it, you know, they, because they call it themselves, retired talent. See, I don't believe in this, this thing about 65 as the required, you know, retirement oh, age. Oh, life gets better after exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. The ancient Vedas suggest that the natural lifespan is 120. So 65 to me is I'm about, 65 to me <laughs> is, uh, is midlife. Okay? But my point is that 65, some, something didn't suddenly turn off in your brain that you're no longer useful. Okay? In fact, what I believe retirement is is that you get to decide what you want to do versus what you have to do to take care of your family and other well, you know, responsibilities. Well, it's a great asset. It's it, an well, asset, it is. like the car and the time you talked about well, in the case of Uber. Yeah. It's an asset to be played, and uh, if you can connect with that and you can use you know, computing power yes. to, to manage that asset and leverage that asset, it's got to go in the right place. So what, what's, the, what's the ultimate goal here? Yes. Is, are you, you want to you know, do the 11% so and make everybody happy, or do you want to put yourself on, a, you know, on a, a tropical island with a mint julep? Well, I, I mean, maybe perhaps a little bit of both. But, uh, I, and I'm already on a tropical island. Okay. Uh, uh, so, um, but I, what I'll say is what the real mission of Shreem is, in addition to the social impact side of it, is, okay, Facebook and those m number of these companies have been, you know, in the press recently about how essentially your data is used against you. Okay. Now I've worked in the cyber se security and intel field, and I'm telling you, it's been going on for a very long time. Yeah. Okay. Your data is used against you. Yeah. Yeah, we knew from the New you York have a days. Facebook account? Yeah. Um, I, it's you put profile up. No, there? none, none. Okay. I in fact deleted all my accounts. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those people that you actually mean deleted. Them. Yes. Oh, well, I had. I've never had too many of them, but I. I only keep LinkedIn, and this is not a pitch for LinkedIn, but I kind of like LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, but no, what I was saying was that data has been used against you. As we say in New York, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And data that you think, you know, a lot of people are not aware that they go on and post all this information and whatever it is. And this is not, again, I like Mark and, you know, a good guy and he's done a lot of great stuff. But I'm talking about the fact that these companies' business models are fundamentally driven by collecting as much data about That's you as true. possible and then selling you stuff or doing, using it against you. You know, maybe you could give him a call. Mark? Yeah. yeah, he's on Kauai. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's an 808 that's, number. Yeah, 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 Give him a call, maybe you know, pop up at his house one day and ask him to come on the show. I will. Yeah, I, yeah, think, yeah, you yeah. Know, I have some questions. Well, uh, uh, them, Google, I mean, come on. You know, uh, you know, it's a, you know everyone is, and, and I don't believe as a consumer. You know, it's all about relationships, isn't it? It, it really it's is. It's all about connecting up and networking, and this is a great place for that. So I'd like to have you come back. And you want me to bring Mark? Bring Mark. Oh, I'll bring Jim. Square. I mean, that's okay, pretty bring, amazing. Yeah, bring Jim. I'll, I'll, get a, I'll get a crew. You yeah, know, okay. and then, All yeah. right. Yeah. And, we'll, and, and, and we'll talk some more. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to need that I want to follow your. You want to follow your company. I uh, hope absolutely. it's successful. I hope you make all the right moves. And I'll see you back at this table. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take further status on it soon. Jim, uh, Jay, thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here. Prashant, nice to meet you. Nice to talk with you. I knew it would be like this. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>